We ask that you loose the Holy Spirit upon us that we might be able to uh, take these words, um, apply them to our lives, that we might live for you in this fallen world, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the provision of your son, Jesus Christ, the perfect provision for our salvation. Uh, for those who have not come to, to know him as their, their Savior, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit work mightily in their lives and while working in ours so that we might uh, be an example and be the words that, uh, that they would need to hear uh, to uh, make that eternal decision. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Gloria Furman is a Christian author, um, prominent in writing uh, about womanhood and motherhood. She is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary and the wife of a pastor of uh, the Redeemed Church in Dubai. Okay? Um, and she is quoted as saying, I need God's grace and something baked with peanut butter and chocolate. Amen. Um, today is Sunday, July 23rd, 2023. And if you were so inclined, you could look it up and you would find that today is the National Peanut Butter and Chocolate Day. There is no greater combination on this planet or any other. I don't find it in scripture yet, but I haven't found the part about homemade ice cream either, but I'm sure it's in here. I just need to search a little longer. I, I point that out um, for no other reason than that might be the only chuckle we get today um, because we are going to uh, be studying uh, a passage of scripture that is been described as grotesque. Oh yeah, glad you came today. Um, brutal, horrific, the stuff of nightmares. And I got to tell you, it's not, it's not been nightmarish for me, but it has been very convicting for me because over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about all scripture being inspired and profitable, uh, the position of our church. And some of you who have been in this adult Bible study for a while will remember uh, that we spent a considerable amount of time in the book of Judges. Okay? And I, for some reason... Um, decided to stop that study at the point of Sam, uh, Samson, okay? We didn't go further on. And one of the reasons I think I know is because of the ending of the book of Judges. It is brutal. It is horrific. It is the stuff of nightmares. It probably should have been held back for you till somewhere near Halloween or something like that because... This is, this is the type of topic that we're dealing with. In fact, David Guzik, who is an excellent expository pastor uh, from out in California, writes this. What unfolds in the rest of this chapter, okay, and he's talking about Judges 19, is so distasteful that commentator F.B. Meyer recommended not reading it. Commenting on this first verse, he wrote, it will be sufficient to ponder these words which occur four times in the book, without reading further in this terrible chapter, which shows the depths of depravity to which men may sink apart from the grace of God. Now, that was a tongue-in-cheek um, type of comment from, from Dr. Meyer. Um, obviously, he's not re recommending um, uh, that we, we not read uh, this chapter, but it is a tough read. It is a very tough read, um, but we're going to take a look at it, um, I should not have pulled up short uh, in our study of Judges, so I'm going to attempt to um, uh, rectify that. All Scripture is inspired. It is God-breathed. It is profitable, including the last three chapters of the book of Judges. This story will give us a peek into the terrible depravity of mankind when there's a rejection of God and the seeds of depravity are passed on and on from generation to generation. We will see that. And Paul tells us in, in tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, these things happened as an example to us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Key verse would be Judges 21, verse 25. I believe it's the last verse in the entire book of Judges. 
So Judges 21, 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So I lead with that. I lead with the end, um, you know, kind of begin with the end in mind, because what we are going to see in the next, uh, uh, next few chapters here of Judges, starting with uh, Judges 19, th that is the coda, okay? That statement is the coda. This is not God-sanctioned activity. This is what happens when man goes his own path, satisfying, attempting to satisfy which is right in his own eyes. A main lesson is that when evil is not dealt with properly and promptly, it has a tendency to grow. And we will see that. Paul, remember Paul's rhetorical question um, in 1 Corinthians? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Okay, so we will see the insidious nature of sin, which we saw, by the way, over and over and over again in the sin cycle of Judges. You're just going to see kind of an appendix here. Sin begets sin, evil produces evil. And once you start down that pathway, absent restoration of fellowship with God and under God's divine direction, it go, gets worse and worse and worse, even when you think you're making a good decision. Okay? So let's buckle up. We'll start in uh, Judges chapter 19. Let me give you the cast of characters. You have someone named a certain Levite, from Ephraim, okay, from the tribe of Ephraim, a certain Levite. That means he's from the priestly tribe. He is a priest, okay? He is uh, supposed to be a leader of the Israelite people in the ways of Levitical law. You have his concubine in this story. And we're not going to go into a lot about concubinage. In fact, probably not going to deal with it much at all. Um, I think there's, uh, we'll, we'll just hit some of the highlights that, that, uh, that will, I think, enlighten uh, how we can take this, this passage of Scripture. You will see an old man, an old man from Ephraim who is living in Gibeah. Okay? You will briefly be introduced to that old man's daughter. Somebody, uh, his daughter is a virgin, okay? and he introduces her that way. You will be introduced to the men of Gibeah, and there will be a brief mention, though not in chapter 19, of the high priest of Israel at this time, Phineas. Okay? Phineas uh, is in the direct line of Aaron, okay? and also gives us a clue as to the timing of when this event occurs. And let's go to when it occurs. Well, we're not told specifically when, in the context of the full book of Judges, this occurs. Some people, and, and, I, and I tend to agree with them, commentators believe this would have happened fairly quickly after the after you know the the occupation of the holy land okay uh, if you want to kind of put it in a rough general historical framework since we've been studying about daniel um, for quite a bit of time this would be about 700 years or so prior to daniel okay so seven centuries before daniel somewhere around there um, if you were to put it into your own context today if you were to back up 700 years from today, the length of time would, well, Columbus would not have sailed the ocean blue yet, okay? So that's how far, that's kind of the time distance from the thing that we've studied most recently in terms of, of biblical history, okay? There's a few places that are involved here. You will see Bethlehem involved. Um, it's amazing how many times you see Bethlehem, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, but you will see Bethlehem. Uh, we've already, I've already noted you, the, the remote hill country of Ephraim, okay? You will see a place called Jebus, or sometimes re as Jebus, uh, as some people will uh, call it, and that will eventually become Jerusalem. In the ancient, ancient time, uh, that city was known as Jebus, or Jebus, okay? And sometimes Salem. Now, when David takes it militarily, okay, that's when it becomes Jerusalem, okay? But it is inhabited at this time in history by, prominently by a group of Ammonites called the Jebusites, one of the many ites. We will see the town of Gibeah, 
Uh, some people will pronounce it Gebeya, uh, but um, I, the, the, the folks that I, I listen to most closely will refer to it as Gibeah. It is a town very close to Jebus, Jerusalem, um, in the uh, land of Benjamin. So it belongs to the tribe of Benjamin. So let's take a look um, at the story. Uh, and We won't read all of the verses here. We'll try to hit some of the, of the highlights, and then I will fill in your gaps for you. But you have Judges chapter 19, verse 1. Now it came about in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, who took a concubine for himself from Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, that does not mean he kidnapped her and took her, okay? But she is from Bethlehem in Judah. He is from Ephraim. He is a Levite. Already we are introduced to a few problems. You know things are going to go off the rail, okay? One, you have a Levite living and sojourning in a non-Levitical town. They are supposed to be in the Levitical town, okay? Problem number two is he has taken a concubine, okay? Now, that's not a strange cultural event in, that, in the Middle East at this time, okay? Not strange at all. In fact, during the days of the patriarchy, during the days of the monarchy and so forth, uh, and even beyond, concubinage was uh, a, a culturally approved of practice. Biblically, God does not endorse that. Genesis 2.24 this is God's preference rather than concubinage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's God's perfect design for the family. Okay? Um, but I do want to dispel one issue because the way language changes here, you might have conjured up in your mind, as I do, what would a concubine be? Okay, and if you if you are if you are as I would have d done and I do some think concubine means kept prostitute or something like that. That's not the situation here. Concubines in those days had rights. Okay, they didn't have as many rights as the wife in the relationship, uh, but they were in effect considered married. Okay not under God's law, but they were considered in an, a, an official relationship above that of a laborious slave, but below that of the wife. So secondary to the wife. They had rights. Their children were considered, that were sired by the, uh, the patriarch, the, the man of the family, were considered legitimate, okay? But they didn't have all of the inheritance rights necessarily afforded to the, uh, the, the children of the wife, okay? So you say, why are there concubines? It's a good question. Because of sin. See, God's perfect design in the garden was man and woman. That was the perfect design. When sin entered, and by the way, there would have been no poverty without the fall. There would have been no poverty. Just like work would not have been toilsome, okay? That's a part of the curse, okay? There was work before the curse, but it became toilsome, became burdensome after the curse, okay? So there would have been no poverty in God's perfect design, but sin enters in, okay, and messes with that, okay? messes it up. So a lot of the concubinage was done as economic reasons, okay, as well as for purposes of inheritance, because sometimes the wife might be barren. We've seen that story in scripture many, many times. But the concept of concubinage is not God's perfect will for the family. And yet this Levite, who, by the way, could have been married, okay, there was no prohibition against the Levites being married. There but this was not in God's will, okay? Jesus reaffirms the principle of one man, one woman in Matthew chapter 19, if you want to research that at your own time. Problem three, the statement, there was no king in Israel. You say, well, how is that a problem, okay? 
because God keeps raising up judges, right? In judges. Well, there's a problem here because is there a king in Israel? Not a, not a man king, but Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. And he was just as much king of kings then as he is now and will be at the end time. So there was a king they just chose not to recognize and follow that king. So you got three problems right in first one. Boom. You know we're, we're headed to, to, to some problems. So here's the, here's the storyline. The, the scripture says the concubine played the harlot, okay, and left the priest, okay, left the Levite, and went back to her father's house in Bethlehem, okay? Now there's two possible explanations for the phrase played the harlot. I take the literal one. She was unfaithful. She was unfaithful. There's also uh, interpretation of that language says she became angry at the priest. I'm going to point out that those are not necessarily mutually exclusive. She could have become angry at the priest and become unfaithful to the priest. Okay? And she leaves. She takes off and flees back to her father's house in Bethlehem, okay, where she has been there for four months. You could make a movie out of this. You'd call it the runaway concubine. Okay, that's so she's back in Bethlehem. Oh, see, we got a chuckle. That might be the last one you're going to get. Okay, so what does the priest do? After four months, okay, he pursues her. So he travels down to Bethlehem, okay, where he meets, and the scripture records it as this, his father-in-law. Okay, that will tell you, that will give you an indication about the status circumstance of that, that it it, this is how it was really viewed in those days, okay? So he takes with him his servant and two donkeys. So he takes his servant and he takes two donkeys. That may be important here in, the, in this story because this implies, as well as the, the, ha the actual uh, uh, having a concubine, that this priest was pretty wealthy, okay? He's pretty wealthy. But why would he take two donkeys with him, do you think? Bring her back would be one, but you'd only need one donkey to do that, okay? Because it says he's bringing them with him, okay? The other one is he's packed his own provisions, okay? He's packed his own provisions. This man, this priest, is pretty wealthy, which brings up some interesting concepts that we see in the New Testament about God or mammon. But he had enough wealth to have at least one concubine, two donkeys, and a servant, and to be able to travel in that in that time period he stays four days okay he only really intends to say three days okay and there's a phrase my mom used to use about house guests in three days and stuff like that but he stays for three days okay and they keep talking about the 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 the, the man of the house the the father-in-law keeps saying stay longer stay longer come on let's let's eat and drink be merry enjoy my hospitality you know this that and the other they're you know, some commentators will point out that the, the father-in-law is probably a little embarrassed, okay, about, you know, his daughter having, you know, fled and returned home. So for, for four nights, you have dude's night out, okay? You have dude's night out. It's not bachelor party, okay, because he's not a bachelor, okay? But there's no mention of the concubine during this time. She's been kind of cut, cut out of the story after you hear the phrase that the Levite spoke tenderly to her. This is another clue, right? It says he spoke tenderly to her. Some of your translations may something say something a little differently, but when he arrives, he speaks beautiful words to her. Um, I might, oh, you're so beautiful. Why do you run away? I forgive you. This, that, that, come back with me. You're so lovely. I, I wish to, 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 to have your presence. Um, Maybe we will actually talk and not stare at our cell phones when watching television. I don't know. I don't know what he's telling her, but he speaks tenderly to her, okay, which tells you a couple things, okay. I, I, well, it tells you one thing in, in particular, I, I think, that um, um, this dude can talk the talk. He can talk the talk, but you're going to find out pretty quickly he ain't walking the walk when it comes to this. It also tells you she has a choice, he didn't say he came and just kidnapped her, just grabbed her, 
and, and took her back, okay? So that's what's happened for four days, four nights. The priest is partying it up. The concubine is kind of cut out of the story at this point. But on the fifth day, the priest finally gets on the road, okay? But not after delaying. The, 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 the father-in-law delays him even longer, okay? And so instead of getting up at the earliest portion of the morning and traveling in daylight, you know, as far as they can travel with great plans, delays until uh, the middle of the day and then takes off and, and starts going. And, and folks, this, this, this time, of, this time of, it's not easy to travel. It's not safe to travel even many places even today. But this would have been treacherous travel, okay? So they, they, they take off and they start passing by um, the, the, what becomes Jerusalem, the town of Jebus, okay? Uh, the, the servant who is with them says, hey, let's go in there. It's getting dark. It's getting dark. Let's stop there, okay? okay? The challenge here for the priest, though, is that those are Jebusites. That's not under the control of... Of, of the Israelites. These are foreigners. In Texas, we'd say foreigners. They're foreigners. Okay, these are pagans. Okay, these are pagans. I, we're, we're not going to stay there. They did not have courtyards by Marriott or Holiday Inn's Expresses or anything like that in those days. So he says, we're going to go on further to either Gibeah or Ramah. Okay which are under the control of Israelites. So his thinking here is, I'm not going to be safe in Jebus, in Jebus. I'm not going to be safe in what will become Jerusalem. Okay? I want to stay with kinsmen. I want to stay with Israelites, so we're going to make it to Gibeah. I'm not going to make it. Right. We used to take vacations where we just get out on the road, and it was always like, "Well, why don't we stop now?" And there's somebody in this room's like, "We can go further, we can go further." And really, what he was trying to do, I think, was get us just close enough to say, "Well, we can make it all the way." Okay. Well, there wasn't any way he was making it all the way to Ephraim. Okay. But here's the aha: the priest is shunning foreigners, who, by the way would still have be he been, uh, held themselves to the highest standards of hospitality, okay? Shunning foreigners because he feels safer among his kinsmen. Now, Gibeah is about four miles-ish north of Jerusalem, of Jebus, okay? This city would become very notorious, and you're going to see why. In Hosea chapter 9, verse 9, it says, They have gone, in, gone deep in depravity, as in the days of Gibeah, he will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. Hosea 10.9 says, From the days of Gibeah you have sinned, O Israel. There they stand. Will not the battle against the sons of iniquity overtake them in Gibeah? Okay, That's a, that's a look forward as to what the town of Gibeah is going to become known as. So they reach Gibeah. They get into Gibeah. Okay, And it says they go to the town square. Now, the town square would not have been in the middle of Gibeah. It actually would have been closer to the gate of Gibeah. So they, they get into the, into the gate, and they're inside the square, but nobody was hospitable to them. Nobody offered to take them in. That would have been shocking in that time, absolutely shocking, because in the Middle East, hospitality to a stranger, okay, was considered, if not the foremost virtue, awfully close to it, okay? You did not shun travelers at all, okay? And if you're thinking, hmm, I'm looking forward to a certain sojourn uh, that happened because of a decree by Caesar Augustus, you're getting the right idea here. Uh, in Leviticus, it says, When a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It's a command. It's a command to show hosp hospitality to a stranger that is in your town. Daniel Block, a professor at Wheaton College, 
says the last clause in verse 15 would have been shocking anywhere in the ancient Near East, but is, it is especially shocking in Israel. The social disintegration has infected the very heart of the community. People refuse to open their doors to strangers passing through. It makes no difference that these travelers are their own countrymen. It is both, hospitality is both commanded and it is a custom. It is a custom, okay? Anybody seen the movie Lone Survivor? Okay? Lone Survivor, okay? That, go, that actually, uh, well, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but to give you an idea, there's a lone survivor, okay? And that survivor survives because of the hospitality, the Pashtun Wali, okay? Hospitality associated with the Afghan people, okay? It is a custom and it is commanded of God. In fact, are we not told be very, very careful with strangers because those strangers could be angels? Could be angels. We're going to see that come up in a moment. But verse, I keep talking to you about the ending of verse 15. They turned aside there, and in order to enter and lodge in Gibeah, when they entered, they sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into his house to spend the night. That would have been shocking. Shocking. But then an old man, a farm laborer, okay, who comes from Ephraim, who's living in Gibeah, comes in working from the field, and he offers to bring these travelers into his house, okay? And in fact, the priest tells him, the Levite tells him, says, we come with our own provisions. You don't even have to, you know, uh, prepare for provisions. And the man, because of the, 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 his, his bent towards hospitality, says, I will still provide for you. In other words, keep your provisions for another time. I will provide for you. Okay? Here's some irony. The travelers eventually find hospitality in Gibeah, but not from Gibeans. They find it from a foreigner, from a different tribe. And is it possible that this old man knew what fate they were going to suffer if they remained out in the open? In Gibeah, it's very possible. He tells them in verse 20, don't spend the night in the square. Do not do it. Don't even attempt it. Don't, don't, don't stay here. Come, come into my house. So they go back to his house for vittles and conversation, you know, and lodging, okay? Says they make merry there, okay? So they're, you know, they're having a good time. They're conversing. They're eating. They're drinking. They're being provided for. Verse 22, while they were celebrating, behold, behold is a key word here, look, watch out. The men of the city, certain worthless fellows, surrounded the house, pounding the door. They spoke to the owner of the house, the old man, saying, bring out the man who came into your house that we may have relations with him. Then the man, the owner of the house, went out to them and said, no, my fellows, Please do not act so wickedly, since this man has come into my house. Do not commit this act of folly. Gibeah, we have a problem. And if this is already conjuring up in your mind another circumstance in Scripture, you're getting the right one. Calls these folks worthless fellows, the men of Gibeah. This translates to sons of Belial, okay? Sons of worthlessness. I'll give you some synonyms. Scoundrels bent on evil, aggressive, idiomatic for sons of hell, idolaters, neglectors of the poor, immoral, drunkards, rebels against authority, rascals and miscreants, the basest of men. That's sons of Belial, that's worthless fellows. should point out here that homosexuality was prevalent among the Canaanites. Prevalent among the Canaanites. We know this, okay? But these weren't Canaanites. These were Benjamites. These were of God's chosen people. And they are demanding in a threatening way, aggressive way, 
to have sexual congress with this Levite banging on the door. The defining characteristic of a Canaanite community has now become a defining characteristic of an Israelite community. There is, unless you're wondering, there is no doubt, zero doubt, okay, that this, what this text means, okay? The word is yada, which means to have sexual experience with. So I asked you earlier, does this remind you of a circumstance that you may have read before? You just got to go to a different chapter 19. Genesis 19. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. He said, now behold, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house, spend the night, wash your feet, and you may rise early and go on your way. There's your hospitality. There's your hospitality. Okay. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. Ah. Yet he urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he prepared a feast for them, baked unleavened bread, and they ate. He's provisioning for them. Okay, Don't stay in the square. Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter, and they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we might have relations with them. Same word. Same word. So Gibeah, many, many years later, is now on par with Sodom and Gomorrah. Note the similarities. Do you remember what Lot attempted to do to appease these men? What did he attempt to do? He offered to give him his virginal daughters. Okay? So strongly was the concept of hospitality held that it in custom but not according to God's laws trumped the care of the vulnerable so Lot offered up his two daughters, his virgin daughters instead of having to give up his guests the big difference is this who were those journeymen in Sodom angels and they were there for a purpose right, they were there for a purpose and they, they could stay that violence, okay? There's no indication here that the Levite nor his concubine were angels. In fact, we are certain that they are not, okay? But maybe, just maybe, this ending will be better than what happened at Sodom. Well, do you remember that statue that we talked about in Daniel? Does it progress or does it devolve? It devolves. So if anything here, the ending of this story is worse. So the old man says, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. Please let me bring them out that you may ravish them and do to them whatever you wish. That phrase, do to them whatever you wish, is virtually synonymous with, with the phrase, do what is right in your own eyes. That's the old man. But don't commit such an act of folly against this man, referring to the priest, but the men would not listen to him, so the man, now you're talking about the priest, seized his concubine and brought her out to them. And they raped and abused her all night until morning, then let her go at the approach of dawn. As the day was dawn, the woman came and fell down at the doorway of the man's house where her master was until full daylight. He threw his concubine, the same one he was speaking so tenderly to, just a handful of days earlier. He throws her out there to this group of men bent on exceedingly evil activity. The old, we don't know what happened with the old man's daughter. Okay? That's not spoken to here. Okay? The picture that you should get here is that the worthless men were pressing and pressing and pressing, and the Levite finally pushed his concubine out. Do with her as you would please, and then barricaded himself in for the night. Such nobility.
Verse 27, when her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, then behold, his concubine was lying at the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, get up and let us go. Well, that's kind. But there was no answer. Then he placed her on the donkey, and the man arose and went to his home. When he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of the concubine, and cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb and sent her throughout the entire territory of Israel. All who saw it said nothing like this has ever happened or been seen from the day when the sons of Israel came up from the land of Egypt to this day. Consider it, take counsel, speak up. Oh, yeah. Told you it got worse. Got worse. There's some things I want you to note here. It says, when her master arose in the morning. Did you get that part? He slept. It didn't talk about like we hear, you know, the, 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 the king after throwing Daniel into the lion's den that he was restless all night long, couldn't sleep, anything like that. It says he arose, he woke up. So callous. Notice this. Here's the picture. He tells her as she's lying there with her hand grasping the, the threshold, he says, get up. Get up. She doesn't respond. So then he condescends to bend down, pick her up, and put her on the donkey. Is she dead? It's unclear. It's unclear at this point. Um, according to Schrodinger's cat scenario, she's either dead or she's not dead. Okay? I will tell you what... I believe, but I'm not going to be dogmatic about this at all, okay? I believe that she was alive, but maybe not, not in a great condition that, that, uh, that it was recoverable, but I believe that she was uh, alive, and I believe that because of the testimony that he provides a little later to the sons of Israel, okay? So he travels back to Ephraim, throws her on the donkey, where he proceeds to cut her up into 12 pieces and sends the pieces to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now this implies that the body parts were sent with both message and messenger, okay? Which a Levitical priest could have done, okay? And he is saying, look at this travesty. In other words, Look at them, look at them, look at them, look at them. Don't look at me and what my role is in this. Look at them, look what they did. Look what they did. There's trouble right there in Gibeah. And then offers a threefold challenge. Consider the cruelty, take counsel to speak up. In other words, don't let this rest be outraged. Get outraged. The priest has denied his concubine a proper burial. He dismembers her and uses her body parts to incite what becomes a civil war. What should he have done? <laughs> we can go back and see probably 50 decisions that could have been made differently, okay? Starting with his own choice of lifestyle, okay? But let's say all of that had gone wrong up to this point. What could he have done? Could have gone to Shiloh. Could have gone to Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was. He could have spoken to the high priest. That is his boss, after all. Okay? He could have let the matter be dealt with through the law of the land. Okay? The Mosaic law. Levitical law. Instead, he chooses to placate his own ego. Okay, his own consciousness and deflect from his role that has now about to create a real geopolitical crisis. And I want to make it very clear, I am not, by focusing on the priest here, excusing the behavior of the men of Gibeah. There are no heroes here in this story. Here's some irony. The Levite, in sending these 12 body parts around, succeeded in doing what nobody has succeeded in doing for a very long time. 
and that is uniting Israel. Deborah and Barak, as strong as they were politically and militarily, didn't unite all of Israel. You remember all that time, all those stories and judges about, and so and so decided to 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 respond to the call, but others didn't. And uh, no, you can get them all here. You can get them all here, save a couple. Okay. I read a commentator, and this is where we're going to stop for 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 the day. Read a commentator this week. It, it, I read it this week. It actually is from several years ago. Okay who suggests that our society, if we had had this situation happen, you know, right here in America, would not be outraged, would not have responded with outrage, that it would have responded with a perverse sense of intrigue. Tell me more. Okay, the way I understand this commentator, he would have, he would have been thinking that, you know, uh, in, instead of being outraged and called to arm to do something about it, we would, we would have on television relentless 24-7 coverage of psychologists and sociologists attempting to understand why did the men of Gibeah uh, do what they did? Why did the priest decide to cut her up? Why, why, why? Let's get to the root cause of, uh, of the why. You'd have prominent panel discussions going on. Investigation TV. Investigation Discovery TV would make a docudrama within a week of what was going on, okay? Um, that it would dominate the news cycle, not because of any type of moral outrage, but because if it bleeds, it leads. I disagree with this commentator. See, I believe in our society, once it was discovered what the purpose of the men of Gibeah were, to have homosexual relations with this priest, it would have disappeared from the collective consciousness in less than five hours. And if it didn't disappear altogether, it would have been only focused on the behavior of the priest. See, another ironic thing here, here is men tend to disregard and tolerate evil until it becomes so blatant that it be can become tolerated no further then they tend to go to the opposite extreme okay and feign great surprise and horror and indignation and shock at such a logical consequence of the very evils that they've been tolerating in their society the entire time so is tolerance a virtue is compromise with sin a divine principle your homework, should you choose to accept it? There's a movie out about that right now. Should you choose to accept it? Is read Romans 1, and it'll give you the answer to that. And then next week, we're going to look at the consequence, the geopolitical consequence of what happens in Israel as a result of this circumstance. And then we will fast forward 300 years and see an additional consequence of what's happening because when sin infests it infests for a very very long time but thankfully this you get thankfully we have God's grace we have God's grace we have chocolate and we have peanut butter too but we have God's grace let's go to the Lord in prayer most gracious heavenly father we thank you for the privilege of studying your word we thank you that you have recorded these words so that it can be an example uh, for us to not fall into the complacency of evil, the tolerance of evil, Lord. Uh, we thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, made the perfect provision for sin. We, please forgive us where we miss your mark, Lord, uh, that we will immediately be called to a right relationship you, with you through the confession of our own sin. Lord, we see very quickly when the Christ is not on the throne of our own hearts, Lord, we tend to do what is right in, own our, in our own eyes. Forgive us where we fail you. We stand on your promise that we're two or more gathered in your name. There you will be also. Please come quickly, Lord Jesus, and a special blessing upon this service that will follow. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.